Welcome to Staff Voices by the Center for Deployment Psychology. I'm Dr. Bill Brim. We recently had a couple of questions submitted to our Ask the Expert email on the CDP website, and we thought it would be a good idea to share the questions and response. The questions were, what are the recommended treatments for somnambulism or sleepwalking, and is it considered a treatable disorder? I want to begin by sharing a little bit about the etiology of somnambulism, which I'm going to call sleepwalking during this podcast primarily because it's easier to say. Sleepwalking is a disorder of arousal that falls under the parasomnias group of disorders in the DSM. Parasomnias are undesirable motor, verbal, or experiential events that typically occur during non-rapid eye movement sleep. The disorder is usually benign, self-limited, and rarely requires treatment. Now, sleepwalking was once thought to be an acting out of dreams. However, sleepwalking actually takes place during deep sleep, not during REM sleep, when most dreams typically occur. Because sleepwalking tends to occur in non-REM or slow-wave sleep, it will tend to occur in the earlier segments of the sleep period, during the first third of the sleep cycle, and will rarely occur during naps. A sleepwalker will often perform routine activities, such as dressing and cleaning. Sleepwalking is most frequent in children, maybe about up to 14%, and tends to decrease with the onset of puberty. However, at least 25% of children with recurrent sleepwalking may continue to sleepwalk in adulthood. Bouts of sleepwalking can be triggered by stress, anxiety, and excessive alcohol. Epilepsy is an important differential diagnosis that should be considered. In both children and adults, sleepwalking can be precipitated by a range of conditions, such as insufficient sleep, irregular sleep schedules, staying up late, or waking early in the morning. Other factors include fever, stress, and medications such as phenothiazines, chlorohydrate, and lithium, just to name a few, and other sleep disorders such as obstructive sleep apnea. Now we want to take a look at symptoms of sleepwalking. Episodes range from quiet walking about the room to agitated running or attempts to escape. Subjects may later report attempting to escape dangerous situations or terrifying threats. Typically, the eyes are open with a glassy staring appearance as the subject quietly roams the house. On questioning, responses are often slow or absent. If returned to bed without awakening, the subject usually will not remember the event. Older children, who may awaken more easily at the end of an episode, are often embarrassed by the behavior, especially if it was inappropriate. Sleepwalking has no known association with previous sleep problems, with sleeping alone in a room, or with others, nyctophobia, or fear of the dark, or anger outbursts. The diagnosis of sleepwalking is generally made by history alone, and rarely requires or warrants the expense of an overnight sleep study. An overnight sleep study may be suggested if there are other sleep-related concerns. There are no laboratory tests for sleepwalking. Differential diagnoses include epilepsy, febrile seizures, narcolepsy, periodic limb movement disorder, and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, let's turn to treatment. First, I want to talk a little bit about non-pharmacological treatment. The first thing to note is that sleepwalking is a highly treatable condition. In general, the best treatment is reassurance. The relatively benign nature of the events and the subsequent disappearance in most cases should be emphasized. Every effort should be made to eliminate any environmental or predisposing factors that may be playing a role. For example, ensure adequate age-appropriate sleep duration, address any underlying medical conditions that can exacerbate sleepwalking, such as GERD or obstructive sleep apnea or periodic limb movement. Auditory, tactile, or visual stimuli like loud TVs and radios early in the sleep cycle have also been shown to induce sleepwalking in some patients. Safety steps should be encouraged. Patients should lock doors and windows, remove obstacles and sharp objects from the room. In some cases, alarms might be helpful to decrease the likelihood of one of the main concerns about sleepwalking, injury. In some cases, a person sleepwalking can be redirected to bed in a gentle way especially if it's a child. However, attempting to confront or wake the person can lengthen the episode and may induce resistance or even violence from the sleepwalker. Some experts recommend anticipatory awakenings, which consist of waking the patient 15 to 20 minutes before the usual episode onset time and keeping them awake through the time during which the episodes typically occur. This is generally more helpful in children than it is in adults. If the sleepwalker is in real danger of injury, 
if stress and sleep management have not been effective, or if the disorder is causing excessive daytime sleepiness, then pharmacological measures may be necessary. A range of benzodiazepines, such as clonazepam or lorazepam, tricyclic antidepressants, such as amitriptyline, serotonin agonist and reuptake inhibitors, such as trazodone, and the serotonin reuptake inhibitors have been shown to be useful. Clonazepam and lorazepam in low doses before bedtime and used for three to six weeks is usually effective. These medications prevent the partial awakenings that can cause sleepwalking episodes. Medication can often be discontinued with physician supervision after three to five weeks without a recurrence of symptoms, and this expectation should be shared with the patient as these can be addictive medications. Patients should also be informed that the frequency of episodes may increase briefly after the medication is continued due to a small rebound sleep issue. In the U.S. military, sleepwalking is considered an other designated physical or mental condition that can trigger an involuntary administrative separation due to behavior that is sufficiently severe that the member's ability to effectively perform military duties is significantly impaired. In most cases, both a medical and mental health evaluation is required. Each of the services have a policy guiding this type of administrative discharge. In my personal experience, I've been involved directly or indirectly in at least a dozen admin SEPs for sleepwalking. Many of the cases that made it to the admin SEP process probably could have been prevented by a knowledgeable provider network and a motivated patient. In some cases, the member had already attached himself or herself to the admin process and was not really ideally motivated for treatment. Members seeking medical or behavioral health care have frequently been successfully treated by the minimal interventions mentioned here. So I would suggest assessing for malingering if there appears to be sufficient secondary gain, if good treatment effort has failed, and if the provider is motivated and it's in the best interest of the service to do so. Thanks for joining me for this episode, and I look forward to hearing from you on the provider portal at www.deploymentpsych.org. For CDP Staff Voices, I'm Bill Brim.